a social entrepreneur. Really, it's just ordinary people that have seen a problem that isn't being fixed. I always felt from the start that there would be people way better than me that could do this job. And then somebody told me, there probably is somebody better than you to do it, but they're not doing it. You are. It really is just taking action to actually make it a reality. You get one project across the line and people say, wow, he's not a lunatic. <laughs> it does actually work. All across Ireland, there are people developing new approaches to solving social problems. They invent a solution and have the determination to see it through. In this series, we see the impact that their big ideas and hard graft are having on countless people's lives. One big idea that has taken the country by storm is men's sheds. A men's shed is a social space where men come together to learn, share skills and make new friends. Having started in Australia, the concept arrived here in 2009. Today there are over 450 men's sheds in Ireland, with over 10,000 men visiting a shed every week. At Kilbegan Men's Shed in Shane Lowry country, the lads are gearing up for a bit of sport. How's your golf, Johnny? Very good. I wouldn't hit a cow with a band. <laughs> You're not a major threat to Shane Lowry anyway, I think, are you? No, no, I wouldn't be into his mother. <laughs> how, how would I describe it? Well, it's a place that's all welcoming, very welcoming and uh, homely. I suppose men generally don't. They don't have that collegiality that women seem to have. They meet for coffee in the mornings, all this kind of thing. Men sort of are. So this is. This is just, a, I suppose, a chance to meet up with each other and have a bit of banter and cracking. Excellent characters. I'm, on, I'm the backroom team. You're fooling around with that fiddle and the husk one and the whole thing. You're more interested in the fiddle than you have in the horse. Absolutely. There's enough people on the fiddle in the country, but I'm doing it legally anyway. <laughs> Was it such a simple concept, really? The men's shed is so simple. I'm amazed at when people say to you, like, how could that change your, change your life? So what do the men's sheds, for me, what it brings is a whole new dimension into your life where you get a chance to rediscover yourself, to find stuff about yourself through that interaction with others, through that uh, broader picture, maybe, that you see. All these men coming from different backgrounds, different workplaces, different family relationships, different views on life. It's a melting pot and it's, I can see where it, it creates a new engine in you. We have computer rooms there, uh, we have fabrication shops there, we have woodworking shops there, we have uh, games there for anyone that wants to play games, there's something for everyone in it. You're under no pressure to do anything. You can come in, have a cup of tea, sit down, talk. If you're not in the or doing anything, you can go home after a cup of tea. Uh, yes. Do you know what? We'll do the news round up now while we have you. Johnny Carrigan, any yeah. news? I was in Croke Park last Thursday. I never oh, thought we had such a stadium in Ireland. Fantastic. It's just a fantastic place. Well worth visit. Yeah. <laughs> well, not an awful lot now. Uh, I'm back in hospital and again in a couple of weeks' time just for the final checkup on me. Oh, so oh, good. Thanks be to God, it's coming on well. That's great news. I can what? see you a lot clearer now. Like, you know. can see You're not the people I thought you were, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you all look different. Yeah. And Charlie, the yeah. news. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. My, uh, my, my, my little, my son Ezra, 13 months, just started walking. So uh, <laughs> he's. He's keeping me on, on my toes now. I'm finding him everywhere, behind doors, turf barrels, <laughs> bins. No, he's not picking up a West Meath actually. God, the reason I came along was I suffer uh, with mental health. It gets me out of the house for whatever it is, the, hour, the morning. It's called a, it might only be one day a week, but it still gets me out of the house for an hour. And believe it or not, that's actually made a huge difference, yeah, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, they just, they lift you, they do. They, they give you, and it's, it's nice to be there to try and to lift them as well. After the first day, I was the very same as I was here a lifetime. It'd be easier for me now to talk to Tippy or any of the boys in the men's shed about my problems than at home. 
there was a couple of men here that had had prostate cancer and uh, we used to come in and chat about that, keep on another going. Frank was a member here when I joined uh, there. He was a great character and uh, he used to sit beside me and he'd be asking you and helping you, you know, telling you what to expect because he had gone through it and he was finished and he was saying, no, this is, this is coming up next and you'll feel very weak or you'll have no energy and you, know, you, know, you were prepared for what was coming. Like it's, it's good to get it off your chest and to know that someone cares about you. They used to uh, ask and ring me down there when I was in the hospital and they were very supportive. They let Frank Yogan there, you know, we were all visiting him and up for him and getting prayers said for him and hoping he'd get better, you know. But we were all there from the whole way through. So that kind of puts into perspective life, you know. Though it's a big part of his life now, the idea of the shed was very new to John in the beginning. TP rang me. I had a clue what he was talking about. He said, sure, go and I'll give it a go. I haven't a clue where it was going or who it was meeting. There was about 50 or 20 guys there that I didn't know. Before I left that evening, they were regarding as my friends. And they're still my friends, you know. It was the best move in my life I was going to the shed because I've learned so much in it. I learned that there's an awful lot in life to, to enjoy. Um, Lord Mercy Morning, before I, she died, she said, told me that. She says, Johnny, she says, you keep going. I remember when she died, there was people in and out here, just, you know, there was always somebody here with you. But then two days after, it was myself and Ivan and Karen and the two grandchildren. And they had to get up, go back to work, and go in the car and head it off. And I walked in here and there was nobody here me. Myself. And I said to myself, yes, either sink now or swim. So I said I was going to swim. It was, it was a terrible evening, that, do you know? It was probably the loneliest evening I ever had in my life. But I picked myself up. I'd have to say the shed was a big help to me because they, were, they, they understood it. And, and from there on, I, I feel that getting through life and I'm happy and I'm enjoying life. Maureen was... Maureen, <laughs> that's her up there. I'd safely say she made me. When I met Maureen, she made my life. Because I was fairly... <laughs> <laughs> she was a great wife, a great mother, and she loved football and hurling. We went over to France one time on holidays with the friends of ours. And one lovely Sunday evening, it was about nine o'clock at night, it was gorgeous. We're out on the lawn having our dinner. And one of the lads says to Maureen, would you like to live here? She says, no. And he says, why not? Ah, she says, I'd miss the Sunday game. There's <laughs> an awful lot of good things in this world and this, and just bloody well grab them. You can't be going around with your head down the whole time, can you? TP every day we go to the shed when the tea is drank and he goes through everyone individually and asks them how they were, what they had done in news. Why I think that's good for men. It shows they're not forgotten. They're not ignored. Those men are not ignored. If someone is thinking of them and wants to know how they feel and how, what they're, they're doing and they're imp they feel important. It's nice to feel important. In some parts of Ireland, there are longer waiting times for medical assistance. John Kearney is trying to change that. In Cork, he is gearing up for a big day, the first flight of Ireland's first dedicated charity-funded air ambulance. Social entrepreneurs often find funding their big ideas to be a challenge, and many ultimately depend on fundraising, crowdfunding or philanthropy. But will John's big idea take off? We are here in Ratcool Aerodrome, um, I suppose at a key milestone, um, just waiting for the helicopter to go live and be calling his first mission to go up and save lives. This has been a, a tremendous, interesting journey over, over many years to get to this level. And from today onwards, the people of the region will have the benefit from a life-saving um, air ambulance that will be available seven days a week. The team in ICR have a very big job to bring in the resources to keep it in the air. And like that, we still have two million euros to raise to keep that active. So we'll need the help 
of everyone in the community and that's important that they do come on board and take ownership of this and uh, make this a part of it because it doesn't matter where you are and what you have in your pocket at any one time when you have an emergency time is key critical and that's what the message is we have to have the support of everyone Pilot John has done the pre-flight checks and has gone over the systems the team will use when they go live today for the first time. Okay, so a call comes in. What I'm interested in as a pilot is the location uh, we're going to, and that, that gives me then a direction uh, of travel, which I need to know just to see where, where we are going. And obviously then, a simple device, piece of string, tells me we're going to go out for 30 odd minutes. Quick check of uh, terrain en route. Um, I can see it's, it's, it's all over fairly low ground. Once I have that, while the medical crew are taking the rest of the, the details of the incident, I go out, get into the aircraft, put my helmet on and start. With practice, we can be airborne from the phone going airborne in about two minutes, two, two and a half minutes. So it's actually quite a quick uh, process. With everything ready to go, all that's left to do is wait. Not an easy task for a man of action. Can biscuits, Chris? Huh? Good. Make me, make, me, make me feel less guilty. It's been a long journey to get to this stage. This air ambulance is projected to attend up to 500 calls a year. So that's 500 communities or 500 persons, 500 families that could be seriously helped by this. The impact is going to be immense. Another man to Mizzen cyclists, mm -hmm. um, they did that crazy cycle in 24 hours from Malin to Mizzen Head for us. Yeah. They um, gave me a call. Uh, they're popping down this week to present us with a check, and okay. they raised us over fourteen thousand euro. Wow, that's incredible! The chief pilot just came into me and said, "We are live," so that means that anyone in the region is in difficulty and they need emergency um, asset. The helicopter goes live, so it's 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 an incredible, momentous um, time. So. I better start ringing around to see where, where can I get two million euros. That's my next challenge. I'll have, hopefully have that done before tea time. Um, and then I can relax completely, but no, it's, 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 it's exciting. The biggest thing someone said to me one time, and it is true, there is sacrifices, there's sacrifices from my side. I'd be very wrong not to mention the people that are closest to me and, and, and care the most, they suffer the most when the likes of a social monitor is very determined and very motivated. That can be the, the diff most difficult part of it. We're off. The first call has come in for the air ambulance. After years of planning, negotiation and fundraising, John and his team will finally see their idea become a reality. You did it! You did it! <laughs> yeah. I'm happy. That's all I have to say. I'm really happy. Meanwhile, in Tala, the founders of Food Cloud have a vision of a world where no good food goes to waste. These social entrepreneurs gained an insight into the problem they're trying to solve through sheer commitment. Internationally, it's estimated that 30 to 50 percent of food is wasted, and that is obviously a waste of money, it's a waste of resources, and it does raise moral questions when, on the other hand, people mightn't have access to food. So that is the problem that we're trying to solve by bringing food industries and the charity sector together, creating a local solution to what is a huge global problem that can sometimes feel way too big to even try to take on. So we have two solutions in Ireland. Um, the first that we set up uses technology, um, so that if a supermarket has food left at the end of the day, still perfectly edible, but they won't be able to sell it the next day, they can use our app to notify a local charity about the food that's available. That charity can then go directly to the store and collect the food from the supermarket. 
Our other solution allows us to collect much larger quantities of food from further up the food supply chain. So we've got three warehouses, one in Dublin, one in Cork and one in Galway. And when large quantities of surplus food are made available, then they can either deliver or will collect, store them in our warehouse and then distribute them out in more manageable quantities to charities. Vivian is a passionate advocate for Food Cloud's mission to transform surplus food into opportunity. A to D here is surplus food. So this is this is ambient stock that would have come in over the last couple of days. So here, like we have an order that's come in uh, from Lidl, so fresh fruit and vegetables. We get fresh, fresh milk. Um, our our partner Glambia has donated some soup. Surplus food is perfectly good food that any of us could have ended up buying, but for various reasons, um, it did not end up on a shelf or in our homes. Maybe overstocked, maybe seasonal, uh, maybe a, a mistake in a production line. We had one um, incident where we had um, mint chocolate chip ice cream where the chocolate chips didn't disperse evenly across the entire batch. So some charities got very chocolatey mint chocolate chip ice cream and some just got mint ice cream. <laughs> with maybe a few chips. Um, so it is crazy when you see all of the different uh, reasons why surplus arises, but the food is always perfectly good, often interesting and always delicious. Vinny spends a lot of his time in the fridge, checking the quality of the incoming food. I spend a lot of my days in here. Um, we get products in from different companies. Everything has to be counted in, checking the weights, checking the dates when it's to be used by our best before. Temperature checks before they come in, you have to make sure everything is correct as they arrive. Because um, you have to look after the uh, safety of everybody who's receiving anything. You can't just presume it's good, you have to check it. You can see each label has the best before date, the product description, and how to use it. You never know what's coming in next. So you have to keep on top of everything. It keeps me busy, <laughs> which is a good complaint. Food Cloud has scaled way beyond just being a big idea and has already had a massive impact. In terms of how we kind of quantify what we do, so we measure everything in kilograms and tons. For example, 22,000 tons, that's, that's an equivalent saving of 72,000 tons of carbon. Um, that would have been released into the, into the atmosphere had that food gone to waste. When you calculate that in terms of the numbers of meals that have supported charities, you're looking at a figure of over 50 million meals across Ireland and the UK over the last six years. Like Cheeverstown House, who we work with, have created two full-time posts out of the savings from, from um, working with Food Cloud and on the savings on their food bills, which really kind of puts, puts into context the benefits the food can have. So as consumers, we're all opening up the back of the fridge and throwing out that packet of raspberries that we missed from last week's shop. And we're, we hate doing it. We think about it in the context of money wasted, but maybe we don't think about it in the context of kind of the climate change impact, the impact of all the resources that went into actually produce and grow and transport those raspberries to get into the back of your fridge that you then threw in the bin. We still expect to be able to go into a retailer at seven o'clock on a Saturday and have all the things that we need for our weekly shop. Um, so, you know, it, there's definitely kind of a balance in terms of how we consider our own behaviour and how that affects food waste. In Bray, O'Coolan housing founder Hugh Brennan is setting out to visit the site of his latest project in Ballymun. O'Coolan is working to deliver well-designed, energy-efficient homes at an affordable price. The model relies on support from local authorities through discounted land and the waiving of development levies. As you can see, it's an electric car. It's just part of our sustainability drive, if you like, you know. The houses are all A2 rated. We want to make sure that our transport is something similar. So we're off to uh, Ballymun. The actual area is Illoin na Cranoiga, Cranog Islands. And there are 37 uh, units, 37 houses. They're a mixture of two bedroomed, three bedroomed and four bedroomed. Our model is what we call a fully integrated cooperative affordable model. And the affordability, obviously, in today is really important. We 
have this housing crisis that's been going on now for, for some time, but a central part of that is that it is an affordability crisis. And there should be more affordable houses being built at the moment, and hopefully they will come on stream from others and from local authorities. But at the moment, as we sit here, O'Coolan is still the only one providing affordable houses for sale in the country, as far as we can see, as far as we know. If there's anybody else out there doing it, we'd love to hear about it. The demand is huge, absolutely huge, even though there are you know, strict eligibility criteria in terms of 70% of the people have to be either living or working in the local area. The income limits are 59,000 for a single person. You can't have earned more than that in the previous tax year or 79,000 for a couple. They are 102 square metres. If you want to do it in Imperial, around 1,100 square feet. Um, A2 rated, as I say, that's important and they cost 219,000. That's the front of the house there, that's the front door. And so you're uh, coming in through the hall, that's storage space under the stairs. And then you walk into what I say you could describe as a generous uh, space. So you have your uh, kitchen and dining over this side and you have your living over uh, this side. This is the master bedroom. This will be the ensuite with the shower and that will be an opaque window. All of this was done in cooperation with the people in the wider community. When we're preparing the planning application, we hold the public meeting and what we found was that 75% of the people at the meeting were uh, supportive, but 25% were vehemently opposed to what we were doing for various reasons. Um, so what we asked them was, could we meet them separately and sit down and discuss what their objections were? And we did that, and what we found is that it had nothing really to do with affordable housing. In fact, a lot of them sa said, you know, well, would my son or daughter qualify for one of these houses? It was other things in the area, and we were able to help with some of those, because there, there was some work that needed to be done just to improve the area very, very slightly, and we were able to do uh, to do that because we want to work with the local people. In the end, when we put in the application, not only did we not get any objection, we didn't even get an observation. So it went straight through. And I firmly believe this is the way all planning should be done. And I, and I firmly believe that you, that, that, that you, that you would um, reduce the number of objections that you get if you go and talk to the local community first and say, you know, we want our community to be part of the wider community. Next time on Changing Ireland, My Big Idea, we see the impact that these ideas are having across Ireland as we meet some fine singers in Kilcock Men's Shed, food cloud driver Tony, who delivers surplus food to charities, and a family helped by a project that makes visual resources for people with additional needs.